Glory to Jesus Christ. Well, as you heard at liturgy, when Father Marin heard I was going to be in Ohio for the month of August, he had gave me a little assignment to share about the times I spend in Romania. So what I'd like to do this morning is share a few of my experiences, kind of a historical context to that, and then perhaps some of the, how does that impact us today? What can we take away from it? And I'll give you a final thoughts of my own. Back in May, it was my second to last day in Romania, and I was in Bucharest. And I had the fortune to meet a Father Cyprian Gradinaru. He is the disciple of Elder Cleopa of Siestria. Now, as I found out last week when I was talking to Brian, he didn't know who Elder Cleopa was, so let me explain who he is. He is an elder that died in 1998. He is considered the most representative elder and spiritual father of Romanian Orthodox spirituality. And it's anticipated that he will be glorified as a saint in 2025. So Father Cyprian is a disciple of Elder Cleopa. And we talk about the discipleship, the Sturet, uh, Sorcestvo, the, the discipleship. And he has been asked by Patriarch Daniel to be a father confessor from, for Bucharest. So he comes down maybe once or twice a month. And believe it or not, people stand in line 12 to 15 hours to confess to him, to get his spiritual advice. He's very popular. And as divine providence had it, I was at the right place at the right time with my translator who elbows me and says, that's Father Cyprian. And she was a very fast talker and we got to meet with him. And he's a classic monk, you know, with a long gray silver beard. He uh, took his hand, my hand into his left hand and my translator's hand into, her, into his right hand, and he spoke to us. He had eyes that had such peace. He was so quiet and soft-spoken. He's probably the holiest man I've ever, uh, ever met. His gaze was incredibly serene. And he was a man who knew me without really knowing me. So we talk about monks with clairvoyance. He knew a lot about me, it seemed like, or he knew how to give me advice without asking very many questions. And he's proof positive they, they exist. And he said to me, one of the things he said, Romania is a very holy place. And that's one of the takeaways here, that Romania is a very holy place. And he asked me, seeing that I was holding my prayer rope, he asked me, did you read the Russian Pilgrim, which is how the Pilgrim's Tale translates um, Romanian into English? And I said, yes. And he grabbed my prayer rope with his hand and starts praying the beads. And he says, prayer is so important. And the Jesus prayer is the most beautiful. And he continued to pray the beads for a few moments, then blessed the two of us and it's one of those, those encounters I will never forget in my life. This must be like Jesus. This, this is a monk. This is a type that we read about in the Holy Fathers, and they exist. Now, to give you the background, I first visited Romania in uh, summer of 2021. I went with a list of churches and monasteries that I wanted to see. And to be honest, I had no idea what to really expect. But what I observed was just incredible to me. The churches were full. People were standing for three to four hour services. There were so many young families. The reverence for the icons and the relics was incredible. The monasteries were full with pilgrims. And in Romania today, the monasteries are growing. There's over 150 monasteries not counting the little hermitages and all the other places associated with monasteries, and I'm told the number is like 500 total. Now, it was suggested, and many of the monastics are quite young, quite honestly, and I was suggested I meet with this one holy father, Father, father David Roshka, and he was at a hermitage in Vokovoda Yus, which is in Bukovina, a beautiful area of the country, very close to Ukraine, and so I went and asked if he was there, and, well, I was in line five hours. Now when we read about in the 19th century of the Aptina Monastery in Russia and people would wait a day or longer to meet the Sturets, well, I'm thinking to myself, this is pious sentiment. Who's going to wait a day? Who's going to wait five hours? 
but it's true. They wait, and it's really that way. Uh, another experience I wanted to share with you is in Bucharest itself. There's a monastery called Viradu Voda, and each Wednesday and Friday they have a healing service at 7 p.m. So I happened to be there early because I had just arrived in Bucharest that day, and I arrived. I was able to venerate the relics of Saint Nectarius of Echina, who's greatly loved by the Romanians, and then settled into one of the prayer stalls in the back because I wasn't sure I could stand for a few hours. And the church slowly starts to fill up, and there's a big line venerating the relics of St. Nectarios, which is very beloved. And I thought, wow, this is pretty incredible, and the service starts. And well, I've just arrived in the city, so I leave a little bit early. And I'm amazed. This is a day and I walk out into the courtyard of the monastery and there it's full there's at least two two times more people in the courtyard than there is in the monastery and the line to venerate the relics must have been 3 to 500 people and keep in mind this is a Wednesday afternoon or evening it's not anything special they do this every Wednesday and Friday and wow look at all these people and the reverence they have in this devotion to St. Nectarius and these healing services. Which, by the way, I want to mention that because I've never seen it in our tradition in the U.S., but they have these, and it's basically seven epistles and gospels. They're all gospels of healing stories of Christ. They're both physical and spiritual healing, so it's, you know, physician of souls and bodies. So the deacons come through and incense the people during the epistles, They read the Gospels, and at the end, everybody is anointed with the holy oil. And as I said, what an amazing experience because there are so many people there. Now, when you think about that experience, and you look at what's going on in the United States, or where my parents come from in in Germany, in Western Europe, that's not the case of the church. The churches are not full. It's quite the opposite. So my question began to be, after that first visit a year ago, what's going on here? Why are the churches so full? I wanted to know more. So I started doing some reading. And so I did some research, and I felt drawn to go back again to experience what I had seen. And and so I just want to share a little bit about that, because there are some amazing thoughts here. Um, I had read prior to going to uh, Romania the first time a number of the Romanian Holy Fathers. So Elder Cleopa, I'd read him. By the way, he's a favorite of Father Mirren Jr. He he recommended a book to me, and I think there's a book on the, uh, it was in the library. And Arsenio uh, uh, Papakosiak, to name a few. And my thesis for my master's degree was based on the theological framework of Father Dimitrius Stanilawi, who's like the foremost uh, Orthodox theologian of the 20th century, happens to be a Romanian priest. And yet nothing prepared me on that first trip to see all these people and the the religiosity of the people and the the devotion in its, like I said, young families. So when I came back, I found a book from St. Vladimir's Seminary Press on the writings of Patriarch Daniel called Rebuilding Orthodoxy in Romania. Now, that title alone just piqued my interest. And then reading the back cover, and what the back cover said is it wasn't about building, rebuilding physical buildings. It was about the interior life of the people. And I was drawn to read that book, and I promise you, I was not disappointed by that book. The other thing to keep in context, which I didn't realize, is that the Romanian church is the second largest Orthodox church It's second behind Russia. It's bigger than the Greek church. It is a big church, over 10 million. And also keep in mind, Romania had one of the most brutal communist dictatorships of Eastern Europe, the Nicola Ceausescu. And they had one of the longest reigning things. And they threw him out in December of 1998. They had freedom, and there's a big celebration of that freedom there. And you hear Father Miran talk a lot about the communists. Well, this is a big, important point to them. And it, <clears throat> one of the Romanian fathers wrote, Communism destroyed a few hundred thousand people physically, but spiritually destroyed millions. 
What they said is because of the communist re-education efforts to try to come, become the moral authority of the people, to kind of root out Christianity. It was a brutal experience for the people. I think in all the communist countries, but Romania definitely had that. And it's interesting, too, that Patriarch Daniel was elected to the Patriarchate in 2007, so he wasn't there right when the communist government fell, although he was the Archbishop of Yarsh at the time, which is a major uh, diocese there. But he was a Ph.D. student under Father Dimitris Staniloi, and he was also tonsured as a monk under Elder Cleopa. In fact, he just celebrated his 35th, in August 6th, his 35th year as a monk of the Orthodox Church. So I'm not surprised in a way, kind of his background and maybe why I was drawn to his writings. But he realized when he became patriarch, the biggest challenge he had was to rebuild the interior lives of the Romanian people. That was his number one priority. And the priorities he he put in place were the three, three simple things. One, the divine liturgy and the sacramental life of the church. He thought that was so absolutely important. Prayer, and he was very specific, the Jesus prayer, the Hezekiah tradition. And three, philocolic and patristic renewal. As he would write, the divine liturgy is at the center of orthodox spiritual life and it's intended to be a dynamic encounter combining heaven and earth in worship of the triune God. It is the summation of our beliefs, the high point of encounter through the Eucharist. It is intended to be dramatic, deeply moving, and a spiritual action that lifts up the soul. And as Patriarch Daniel wrote, the divine liturgy constitutes the most profound vision of God as a mystery of love and communion. Interestingly, after the revolution of 1998, in which the communist government was thrown out, the patriarch endorsed a movement that they would try to get a priest into every single parish, including every remote village everywhere, so that people could once again have access to the liturgy. This became like the number one priority. Now think about COVID and what's going on in this country. And he, in fact, when they wanted to do a second lockdown in Romania and they said, okay, grocery stores and pharmacies are priorities, Patriarch Daniel stepped up and said, no, the church is also a priority. And the government agreed with him. But they wanted availability of liturgy. Now, secondly, in terms of prayer, Patriarch Daniel wrote, the first and ultimate source of love, of true joy and true peace is prayer. Nothing in this world can replace prayer. Therefore, prayer's communion with God is the life of the Christian soul. And he also wrote, True theology is always born out of the life of the church that prays, confesses, and serves. Whereas where the liturgy is our communal worship, it's prayer that binds us individually to God with a deep, personal, intimate relationship, which in turn will intensify the liturgical experience. Now, given the importance of prayer and what what Romania and the world went through with COVID, Patriarch Daniel decided to declare 2002 as a solemn year of prayer and identified three Hezekiah saints to be the patron saints of Romania for this year. And I've got the poster here of the icon that he had commissioned. St. Simeon, the new theologian, St. Gregory Palamas, and St. Paisius Filichkovsky. I asked uh, somebody from the Basilica News Agency who picked the three saints, and he goes, the patriarch, of course. And I had the chance to venerate this actual icon, which is not actually in the patriarchal church. It's at the patriarch's personal residence in the synodal hall where the bishops meet. Very small, intimate library-type setting. The third area I mentioned was this patristic and philocolic renewal. And I want to differentiate between those two thoughts for a moment. They're a little bit overlapping. But patristics generally refer to the first 800 years of the church, to the spiritual fathers like Basil the Great and John Chrysostom and all those great saints, mostly bishops, 
It was a very fruitful pastoral time when the doctrines of the church were worked out. And so those are considered the patristic fathers. In terms of the Philokalia, though, the Philokalia fathers, you have basically three groups of fathers, if you will. There's the ones that, there's the writings of the Philokalia where the, those saints are included, 34, depending, you know, there's several versions of the Philokalia. So there's those who are in it. There are those who are quoted by the Philokalic fathers who are not in there, like Isaac the Syrian, St. John Climacus, and, uh, St. John Chrysostom, they're often quoted, but they're not, their writings are not included. And then we have the post philokalic fathers, those that continue the trish, tradition, like St. Ignatius Branchininov and St. Theophon the Recluse. So the idea of this philokalic renewal is not just returning to the fathers, but rather, as Patriarch Daniel wrote, gaining a greater grasp of their spirit, What are they trying to tell us in terms of following the gospel of Jesus Christ? And the idea was of this renewal that uh, was going on in the church in Romania was to rejuvenate the spirituality contained in the tradition with the Holy Fathers giving us the wisdom needed to forge a closer relationship with Christ. It's about the interior life, and there's such an emphasis on that. So to summarize, there were three areas, right? Divine liturgy and the sacramental life of the church. Two, prayer, and mainly the Jesus prayer, the hesychastic tradition. And three, going back to the spiritual text of the church. And I remember it's been a few months now since Father Mirren had the homily, but he said when he talked about tools against temptation, what did he talk about? Prayer and the writings of the fathers. Okay, he's not starting something new. This has been, this goes back to the 19th century, which, uh, which is, uh, it's amazing. Now, I want you to take that, those thoughts for a moment and contrast that, what Patriarch Daniel is doing to focus, to go back to the tradition and focus on what our roots, vis-a-vis what else is going on sometimes in the church where people are trying to broaden the narrow gate or try to come up with alternative teachings or try to, uh, justify immoral behaviors. It's like we're in the wrong, this is the wrong arena. We need to be focusing on us, on our heart. Are we in love with Jesus Christ or not? So that's what Patriarch Daniel is doing, and it's amazing to me, quite honestly. And I think that's why churches are full. Now, I want to give you a little historical context, because he didn't just start on, it's not like this brilliant guy to start. He is a brilliant guy, but... um, there's one pivotal player I want to point out, and Father Marin's mentioned him before, and I'll mention him again, St. Paisios Velichkovsky. Now, who is he? He's one of those three Hezekiah saints that the patriarch identified, and he was born in 1722 in Poltava, which was considered at that time Little Russia, but today modern-day Ukraine. He was from a priestly family, and he went to study in the Kiev Theological School, or he felt deeply drawn to monastic life. And after two years of study, he went to the Pachursk Sklavra, the famous uh, church in Kiev. And at that time, people were migrating away from Russia. People were in- interested in spiritual life because under Peter the Great and Catherine the Great, there was a big suppression of monks, particularly outside of large monasteries. So here's St. Paisios in Kiev at the Pachursk Sklavra, and he's seeking a deeper spiritual life, and he meets a monk who's passing through. And he says, you know, there's a deep, rich, Hezekiah tradition in Romania. So he went. He went to Romania. And just to let you know, Athenite spirituality, this Hezekiah tradition, came to uh, Romania already in the 1400s. A disciple of, um, of St. Gregory of Sinai, who is in the Philokalia, his name was Nicodemus of Tismana, he went and started two monasteries in Romania that were under the Hezekiah tradition, under the Athenite rules. And further, there were a lot of uh, Romanian royalty that had contributed significantly to build monasteries both in Romania and several on Mount Athos. Putna, up in Bukovina, near the Ukrainian border, is one of the largest monasteries, and it was built by Stephen the Great already in 1466. So there are already monasteries in Romania that were the basis of this spiritual life. 
So St. Paisius goes to uh, Romania in 1743. He becomes a disciple of Basil of Poina Marului. He, it was from that elder that he learned the prayer of the heart. And then after three years, with the blessing of his elder, he decided he wanted to go to Mount Athos to continue his spiritual journey. And he goes to Mount Athos because he thinks this is the source of And uh, he sets about to seek a spiritual father to continue to guide him. And he diligently searches and searches and searches and finds none. But he's still practicing the prayer. And one of the things he starts to find out about at that time is he hears about writings. There are these writings out there that of spiritual fathers of the ascetical life. And he is... Uh, He's intrigued, and he thinks, you know, these writings would be very important. Somebody's practicing the Hesychast tradition to learn more about it from the authentic fathers of the church. By the way, St. Paisius actually picked up a disciple at that point. Well, it's not a disciple. We'll call him a spiritual companion because a monk, Basarion, came to him and said, I would like to be your disciple. I would like you to be my elder. And he said, no, I didn't grow up in the tradition like I should have. So they confessed to each other each day and they, they talked about the spiritual life, but they didn't consider themselves elder and disciple. They were spiritual companions. Anyway, St. Paisius starts to search around, starts to find these books. He's painstakingly find them. And there's the problem is they're just not in a big library somewhere. They're in little book by book in different hermitages, in the, mainly in the southern part, the rugged part of Mount Athos, written in a Greek that most Greek monks didn't even understand anymore. So there were many challenges to accumulate the text, but St. Paisius was committed. He wanted the original text, and he started searching for them. Now some of you may be thinking, wait a minute, that not that the Philokalia? Yeah, it is, except one thing. Before Nicodemus the Hagarite and St. Macarius of Corinth started their work, Nick, uh, St. Paisius was already started. He was already collecting the text. In fact, he and Nicodemus had met one time on Mount Athos, and they were starting to collect the text. So what you're seeing here is, is the beginning of the Philokalic mo- movement. There is another movement that St. Paisius was indirectly involved in called the Kolovadis, and his father David Abernathy mentions that. But, you know, there's a big thing going on in France and Europe at the time called the Enlightenment. And it is really pushing reason over faith. We don't need a divine being to have reason and to ju- uh, plan our destiny. This is that thinking of the Enlightenment. And it was really working up people in Greece and Russia and all the places as well. And so the monks of Mount Athos, the, the Kolovadis, said, okay, we got to react to this because they're trying to take away the moral authority of the church and make it a secular society. Sound familiar? Anyway, uh, be it as it may, they were pushing, and these monks, these three monks, so Nicodemus, uh, Macarios, and St. Paisios, said, no, we're going to go back to the tradition. We're going to go back to the fathers, and we're going to collect the texts and use these as a basis. There were actually two Philokalias at the time. There was the Russian version. I'm sorry, that's wrong. There was the Greek version that Nicodemus and St. Macarios pulled together, and there's the Slavonic version, Old Church Slavonic, that, that uh, Paisius pulled together. It's about an 80% overlap between the two, right? But what was interesting about that is while the Greek version was actually published in 1782, it really didn't even start having an impact on the Greek church until the 20th century. Whereas St. Macarius, uh, St. Macarius, St. Paisius didn't want to publish his Philokalia. He thought it should only be for monks that were under spiritual direction And so they were doing handwritten copies until finally a Russian prince got him to publish it in 1793, a year before he died. And from that translation came the first Russian version, which was translated by an old friend, St. Ignatius Branchininov, and then later a five-volume version by St. Theophon the Recluse. And that was known as the Dobro Tolubie. So back to... Uh, St. Uh, Saint Paisios. In 1764, he's act, asked by a, a Romanian prince, Grigori III, to come back to Romania to preside over the revival of monastic life. So he and 64 of his companions set sail from Mount Athos 
into the Black Sea, arrived in Romania, and they took up residence in Dragomirna, which is a big monastery. And later, because the, con- the community continued to grow, they expanded into Niamh's monastery. And when St. Paisios died in 1794, he had over 700 disciples. And he is buried at that Niamh's monastery in, uh, in Romania, and it's got an incredible library, as you can imagine. So he collected the texts, he put them all together, he had his monks study Greek so they could do the translations. Um, he had people engaged in reading. So what they would do is not only copy the text, but they would read and explain the text. And the best example of what was going on, and I found it in a biography of Elder Ambrose, which is a Uptina monk. Uh, he's a great, he would be a grandchild of um, St. Paisius, spiritual grandchild. And it says in the, his, his autobiography, um, when the nativity fast began, all the brethren of the monastery gathered each evening, except Sundays and feast days, in the refectory. Candles were lit. The elder arrived, sat down in his customary place, and began reading his translations of the works of the Holy Fathers. St. Basil the Great, St. John Climacus, Abba Dorotheos, St. Theodore the Studite, or St. Simeon the New Theologian. The brethren listened with deep attention. Such readings continued all winter until Lazarus Saturday. Reading a book, the elder at the same time interpreted it, bringing forth testimony from Holy Scriptures, from the Old and New Testaments, and from the teachings of the Holy Fathers of the Church. He had such a gift that by his words he could animate the most despondent, console the most sorrowful, and awaken in each of them the zeal for salvation. Thus the monastery became, in truth, a school of spiritual life, where by word and deed the brethren were instructed in the rules of Christian asceticism. Now if that sounds familiar, like to the Monday night Art of Spiritual Life formation class, it's because that's exactly what Father Mirren's doing. He's doing exactly what the grandchild of St. Paisius was doing, which St. Paisius did with his own monks. So this is not something new. This is in the tradition. And St. Paisius himself wrote, if you depart from the, read, the heeding and reading the patristic books, you will fall away from the peace and love of Christ. That is from fulfilling of Christ's commandments. And there will enter into your midst rebellion, tumult, and disorder, disturbance of soul, wavering and hopelessness, murmuring against many and judgment of each other. And because of the increase of these, the love of many will grow cold, or rather that of almost all. And if such will be this, the community will be dissolved first in soul and with time and body also. So you're hearing St. Paisius himself, who set out to find these holy books, help translate the books, getting his monks focused on translating the books, saying we have to stay close to the writings of the fathers because we don't stay close to them. We'll die. Our spiritual life will die. And so these texts are so critical to give us spiritual guidance to live a life in conformity with the gospel of Jesus Christ. It helps us understand what Jesus meant when he says, if anyone wants to come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. And this is how the daily practice is lived out. Here we have guides over centuries who have followed the tradition and give us their words of wisdom. Now, after St. Paisius died, many of his disciples did in fact return to Russia because the climate was becoming a little more favorable And so he had two disciples like Athanasius and Theodorus Sphere. They influenced the founders of the Aptina Monastery, which was one of the most important spiritual centers of Russia in 19th century Russia. The spiritual children began to beget spiritual uh, children and grandchildren, and the renowned Russian fathers like St. Ignatius Branchininov, St. Theophon the Recluse, even Seraphim of Serev, they can all trace their lineages back to St. Paisios. Not necessarily the children, but the grandchildren and great-grandchildren. And you see that they continue to use the fathers of the church to explain 
how they explain things. Think about when you read St. Ignatius Ranchanina of the field. He's always going back to Dorotea Sagaz and all the, uh, the uh, Isaac the Syrian, all the different uh, fathers, and that's what they did. That's how they gave guidance to their communities. So you see there's a few common themes, by the way. Most of these elders never gave their own opinion. They always talked about the fathers of the church. They always referenced scripture in the writings of the fathers. So the texts are important. And so Father Cyprian mentions to me the Russian pilgrim because he sees the prayer rope. Now it's interesting. The original redaction of that work, which is anonymous, goes back to the Aptina Monastery. Surprise, surprise. And the Philokalia that the unknown pilgrim is carrying around is one from St. Paisius that was translated in the Russian. So you see this historical trend that was always there. All right? Now, going back to contemporary Romania, I mentioned Elder Cleopa Siestria. You know, as a young man, before he's a monk, he used to be a shepherd, and he used to be in the mountains, and he would always borrow books from the library, and he'd always, you know, he's church fathers, right? And when he was a monk, he was also a shepherd, and he would be up in the mountains, he'd always have books uh, of the Holy Fathers in his shepherd's bag, and he would read those when he's watching the sheep. So when you read his writings, he is so well-grounded in the church fathers, but he was reading, even when he's out on the mountain tending sheep. You know, you see this with Elder Joseph, the Hezekas, right? All these people always were grounded. Somehow we're reading these fathers. So the counsel of turning to these fathers is important. And I would say that people like Patriarch Daniel and Father Cyprian are advocating the same. And I do want to mention one other thing that's unique to Romanian spirituality. I mentioned uh, there was the brutal communist repression. And in certain prisons, for some reason... Inmates had access to philatelic writings and the patristic writings. And they would be, they would seek a spiritual father. They would adapt ascetical practices to their prison settings. They would practice the Jesus prayer. They would treat the prison like a monastery. Right? There are examples of this. The ascetics of the Yud prison. One of them is, uh, example is Valerio Gafinku. He was never a monastic. He's called the saint of the prisons. He encouraged many fellow prisoners to spiritual purification and renewal. And through his sacrificial love and constant struggle, he obtained significant spiritual heights. He offered up all his sufferings and encouraged many. He was bedridden and died in a prison in Tirgo Ochna with tuberculosis in a ward for the terminally ill. There were so many people influenced by him including a famous uh, Romanian priest, Father Zimmerman, who was actually Jewish and converted to Christ Orthodox Christianity and buried today in Rohia Monastery. So these prisoners, there was this philocolic tradition that was coming out of the prisoners. Prisons. There's also something called the Burning Bush Movement in Romania. It was formed in Antum Monastery in Bucharest. It was active between 1945 and 1958. It was a group of monks, priests, and bishops that focused on the revival of the Hezekastic tradition. And Father Dimitri Stanilawi was a member of that burning bush movement. He began a Romanian translation with commentary and produced 12 volumes, but unfortunately, when I wrote this, not translated in English. Although I actually found a Romanian that's translated now half of it into English. He just sent me all his documents uh, this weekend, this, this weekend, yesterday. So now we see the Philokalia fueling this drive for spiritual guidance, the growth in the tradition, and it's returning to the golden age of the fathers. And if you look today at what we're experiencing, confronted with hostilities towards the gospel of Jesus Christ, why wouldn't we find solace and guidance in those same texts, just like the prisoners reading it, just like the, the monks and all that. I felt compelled to also tell you, since the movie Man of God came out, and uh, Romanians love St. Nectarius. And big, at Rodovoto Monasteries, the relics, there's the big icon, there's, there's one in Putna Monastery, one of the largest. They all have this great devotion to St. Nectarius. And there's a, there's a great love for the Greek fathers there. But I don't know how many have ever heard this story. It's a well-known miracle story with the Romanians. They know it well. But there was a mountain village, and the people had no priest. 
And there, were, there was nobody there to do baptisms, funerals, or marriages. And it was really distressful for the people. And they kept begging the bishop, give us a priest, give us a priest, give us a priest. I have no one to send, says the bishop. So don't get a priest. One day a priest shows up. And they're like, who are you? You said you wanted a priest. So he immediately set the work. He goes to the, the graveyard and he starts doing the funeral rites at all the tombstones. He starts performing the baptisms, marriages, gives people communion. Finishes all up and he said, okay, I'm done. Time to go. And he leaves. Later, those same villagers go back to the bishop and say, thank you for that priest. He was great. Can you send us another? And the bishop's saying, what priest? I have no one. I told you I have no one. Well, you sent us a priest. Who was he? Don't know his name. Well, surely he filled out records with all these baptisms and funerals and all that. Oh, yes, he did. So he goes, bring me the records. And here they are all filled out in Romanian, except the signature, which the, the Romanian people in that village couldn't read because it was in Greek. But the bishop could read it. Nectarius, bishop of Pentapolis, saying Nectarius had visited that people. So yes, Romania is a very holy place. So let's go back to what we can take away today in our church today. There were three principles of renewal. It was the divine liturgy, the prayer, and the patristic tradition. Let's be clear. There is nothing new here. It's the same sermons you're hearing on Sunday. It's the book study, the formation class, a Monday evening. It's the same stuff that's tied for the last 300, at least the last 300 years, maybe even longer, right? And when we don't have the spiritual guidance in the Holy Fathers and the monks like we used to, it's the spiritual writings that can give us through. Think about the prisoners in the Romanian prisons who read those writings in secret. And today they're much more accessible. There's so many more translations. You can you imagine in St. Paisius, he, he barely published his Philokalia. And as one obtain, obtain elder wrote, if we pay careful attention to these writings, as if we were listening to the fathers themselves, by reading them with fear of God and understanding and with God's help, we can become imitators of the God-pleasing life. I think it's fair to say, in our country, in our church, we are in desperate need of spiritual renewal. So I want to use an analogy. Many of you remember the famous graduation speech that Navy Admiral William McRaven gave to the University of Texas. If you want to change the world, start by making your bed. Remember that one? Okay, it's a great speech. It's on, online, so you can read it. Well, I want to say as Christians, if you want to change the world, pray. Start by praying every day. Pray the Jesus prayer. Even when we're tired or can't feel like we can get up or we're weary or unmotivated, pray. Persevere. Even if you feel cold, even if you want to give up, because there will be times when the spiritual life is dry, pray. Because God doesn't care if we're having a feeling or an emotional response. He cares about, not perfection, that we're making the effort, that we desire him above all things. So if we want to change the world as Christians, I'm going to say, number one, start every day by pray. That's number one. Solemn your prayer. I've got more prayer cards. This is the incredible thing that Patriarch Daniel's doing. And if you look at the Basilic News Agency, there's a lot of focus on prayer right now in, in the move of the year of prayer. Secondly, I would say this. Find a Holy Father from the writings that, that speaks to you. Now, it may take a little bit to find that person, right? Because um, I remember uh, like when we were writing the uh, Fruit of, of Prayer, there's 65 Holy Fathers quoted in there. So, you know, I put footnotes in, and Father Mary and I have always talked about this. We find our sources by looking at a footnote and say, okay, that might be somebody I want to read. And we read, and it sounds like it winds up being pretty good. So, you know, I have to search a little bit, all right? But find somebody and then hold on to them. For example, one I loved, I read all the volumes, was St. Paisios of Monathos, right? He's got these great spiritual councils. There's five volumes in English. I'm waiting for the sixth, which is on prayer. I haven't seen it yet. But 
find somebody, read. And, and as a priest once told me, even if you just read a prayer, a, a page or a paragraph, something every day, something to reflect on, some spiritual food, there are such incredible wisdom. You know, Father David Abernathy does this little one, two, actually about three minute things on St. Uh, Mark the Ascetic online. Find that father and read. Grow spiritually. And lastly, the third point, pray the divine liturgy with intensity. Come ready to pray. Be ready with the fasting and having gone to repentance. And be prepared. Be Maybe even read the scripture readings for the day before coming to the liturgy. So you're hearing it for a second or third time by listening and being ready to participate. Because remember what Patriarch Daniel said. It's about heaven and earth coming together. It's the most profound experience of prayer. And I mean, I felt it today with the choir singing, all that. I think it was like angelic. The the, the music that was, was like angelic hosts while we were receiving the Eucharist. Right? Prepare to receive and drink from the source of immortality. Feel heaven and earth. Because if you're praying and you're reading and you're doing all these things, you're listening to Holy Father, this liturgy will become even more intensive. Three things. That's it. Let's start with those three and let's see what that does to the world. And by the way, it's not the theoretical construct of will it be successful. Romania's proof is successful. The churches are full. So what did I personally learn from Romania? If you ask me, somebody asked, okay. Well, first of all, um, I found that I don't go to countries a second time very often. But after I went back you know, to Romania and did some reading, I said, I was drawn back. I'm still drawn back as a pilgrim. It's an amazing experience. The people you talk to, the Holy Fathers, it's amazing. Now, do I want to be Romanian? Somebody asked me, and I said, no, it's not about being Romanian. It's not about the country we live in. It's what I learned in Romania is the type of Christian that I want to be. I want to be like them. I want churches that are full. I want to do everything I can to have that spiritual zeal burning in my heart and to have others around me who feel the same way. And I realize that I need to be completely dependent on God and directed by the counsels of the Holy Fathers. And I've seen that model. I know what it looks like. I know what a saint like St. Seraphim of Seraph, whose peaceful disposition, I saw it in Father Cyprian. Those priests, those holy fathers exist. I want to be like, more like him. I'll never be like him. I mean, I'm always a little stressed out about life, but he, it's there. But the key is, it's about recommitting to the interior life. And that's what Romania teaches us, I think. So, those are my thoughts. If you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer anything. Yes, sir. Okay, so the question is, I'm going to repeat the question so it gets on the tape. So you're seeing if we're hearing this in our country and we haven't, it seems a little overwhelming at times because we haven't heard a lot of this. Well, where do we start? I'm going to go back to those three basics. Prayer, and we have tools, and Father, you know, get it, get it. I would say start with your pastor or a priest. Go to confession. Start to pray. Start to come to the liturgies and start to really understand the liturgies. Find a Holy Father in the library of books to read and work on ourselves. Because one of the things I learned about, and I've had many frustrations with the church, but the frustration is this. I can't do anything about the church. In fact, one priest told me in confession, I'll never forget, three years ago, no reformer in the church ever had bitterness in their heart. So what that tells me, I've got to work on me. And if people see what I'm doing and that you surround yourself with people and hopefully find a community that feels the same way, that's how it starts, in my opinion. But I think the formula, like I said, it is overwhelming in a way, saying, okay, that's not what I'm hearing in the church. But wait a second, this is our tradition. There's nothing new in anything that Romania is doing or what we talked about, or what Father Mirren's doing in his book study. Not new. So I hope that answers your question, but... I think we start with the basics. 
And yes, I feel overwhelmed at times. You know, the problem is I want to do so many things and I can't do all of them. I can't change the whole world. There was a great way, as Elder Safrani said, I'm going to work on, I'm going to change one person myself. That's how he's going to re- restore the church, if you will. I'm going to work on me. Did you have any encounters with the Romanian church? No, I did not. I did go occasionally because I can't receive Eucharist in an Orthodox church to a Roman Catholic church. Uh, I did not see any really, there are Romanian Catholic churches there, but um, not many. And I'm going to share this. Um, this icon, this icon here is, is said in the Synodal Hall, along with an icon of the Theotokos for this year. And the picture in the front of the Synodal Hall, the painting, is all the Romanian Greek Catholic priests coming back to the Orthodox Church when the bishop stayed Catholic. And they're, they're kissing the ring of the, uh, the patriarch. So uh, it's interesting. There's a Although Patriarch Daniel does talk about the eparchies of the uh, Romanian Greek Catholic Church, so the, I see a little bit of uh, positive signs in that regard. I, I, I'll tell you, I had some real struggles with some people who, like, you're Catholic, what are you doing here? You know, you, you can't have the fullness of joy that I have. But the answer is no, I really didn't spend any time with Romanian But there are many that are... You know, if you come as a pilgrim, they, I mean, they were very gracious and very generous, and it's ama- it was an amazing experience. So, Other questions? All right, well, the Romanian Fathers are great fathers. The Saint in the Prisons is a great book to read, I'll tell you. It's, it's, on, it's on Amazon. I found, somebody gave it to me in Romanian. I read it. I couldn't put it down. It is on Amazon, the Saint of the Prisons. Father Cyprian writes the introduction and the, the afterword to the book, the Father Cyprian Gradinaro that I mentioned. Great book. Short, not too long. Uh, all the Romanian Holy Fathers, Elder uh, Arsenia Poposiak, Pop- Papa Siok and uh, Elder Cleopa, all great. Worth reading. I Father? So the question is, those who study the fathers and they start to read and they feel kind of a tension, if you will, obstacles in their heart, what do you tell the people, like, why should we continue to follow the saints, right? And for me, it's real simple. They went through everything that we're going through. There's always a saint that we can find that has the same struggles or similar struggles to what we have, and it's just enlightening how they approach things whether it's like St. Nectarios and you look at that movie, Man of God, what a beautiful movie of perseverance, right? Or the writings of the fathers or where they were dismissed or the things that they went through or the temptations they saw, they went through. And Father talked today in the homily about the, the I remember the saint in the Evergatinos that he kept repenting, he, he struggled. How many of us have struggled? You know, and it's not us, but around us. And, and we're saying, look, but these people were saved, and they found their way. And so that's why, you, you know, yes, it's frustrating. It's hard to believe that people, God could love us. But the saints are saying, yes, he can. You repent, you go back, you do all these things. And uh, so I think we, the, the, the obstacle we feel is, is the um, struggles that we will experience. And we need to struggle through them. Samuel.
Okay, so in summary, what you know, a lot of the saints I've quoted are Orthodox, and why should I, as a Catholic, listen to Orthodox saints? And I've actually listened to a couple talks on this and how one of the Catholic perspectives are. The honest answer is, they're part of our tradition. My answer is, I got asked a lot, are you Orthodox? And I finally came up with an answer that uh, I felt like I could get away with. It's like, okay, my heart is Orthodox, but my bishops are not. Right? Because our bishops are in communion with Rome. But the reality is, how many of the Orthodox, some of those fathers, uh, quote, Western saints? St. John of the Cross, St. Francis of Assisi, sometimes uh, they call him Blessed Augustine. Even in the patriarchal meeting hall, there's a, uh, a mosaic of St. Augustine. They call him Blessed Augustine because there's not really a name, kind of like, he's not quite a saint for them, but he's, but he's still revered. So they quote them, so why, why don't, you know, it's, it's kind of back and forth. And reality is, I think of it as one church. And by the way, I'll be very clear. Father Cyprian, when I gave that answer to him, when he asked me if I was Orthodox, he just, only God, it only meant, only God judges. He like, he put it all to bed. So I think the reality is these, they're great writers. In fact, there is, um, is breaking the habit. Casey, Father Casey Cole, he's a Franciscan, and he even talked about, uh, five saints of the Orthodox Church that we as Catholics should know. And I would say uh, three, of, three of them are very familiar to us. I can't remember them exactly. And then two aren't less familiar. But they're all saying, look, there's other saints out there. So I think the answer is, look, we go where, spirit, where the well is fruitful or, or plentiful. And I think they're great. Sometimes I wonder, but okay, I'll tell you one other thing. Every one of the theological writings I have to do gets an imprimatur, pretty much, right? And I always wondered what Cardinal DiNardo thinks when 80% of the sources are orthodox sources. And yet I still get a, a Neil Upstott, free from doctrinal error, and a license to print. So he obviously couldn't feel too badly about the orthodox, and I call them saints, too. I don't really differentiate between a Catholic saint and an orthodox. They're saints. They're one of the same church. I write about it as one church. So I think that's the, the, I don't treat it as an obstacle. Now again, Orthodox brethren sometimes have more of it, but I've had seen Patriarch Daniel's writings, and when Father Cyprian said, only God judges, that was so peaceful. In fact, when I went to dinner with my translator and her husband and her older daughter the next day, I said that was such a, a watershed moment for me because I feel like I'm always justifying why? And, you know, once they say, hey, wait a minute, I'm here in this country as a pilgrim. Why do you think I'm here? And it's like, oh, okay. Yeah, so there's, you know, it's not perfect yet. But I, I do want to share one quick story. So I went to put in a monastery, and I was there for morning prayer and liturgy, and I thought, okay, I'm going to ask if there's an English-speaking monk. Well, before I could even say anything, and I'm standing in the back because the Orthodox in Mount Athos said you need to stand in the, in the, in the narthex because you're not Orthodox. So I was standing back, a monk comes up to me and starts talking to me. He's English speaking. I didn't even have to ask. And he started telling me about, you know, well, maybe I need to be rebaptized and I can't have the joy and all that. Oh, by the way, why don't you talk to Father Dosatea? And we, I spent two hours with him. And, uh, we had a great conversation. He gave gifts to me and Father Mira, and he, he thought, I said, you know, I agree with everything you're right. You know, we, we had a great conversation. Well, I come back for Vespers that night, and Father Neil, I'm sitting in the back in the, in the uh, narthex in my little choir stall, and uh, he said, no, Ed, come forward. Come with me. So I come to the middle part of church. He goes, no, 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 come forward. So I was across from the choir stall, the one side, the, the cantors were on that side, and I was on a comparable choir stall in the front. He goes, be here. Same guy in the morning that says, you know, he was giving me a lecture. <laughs> I think people see. I think people see. And that was just a beautiful, again, one of those great experiences. Like, I wasn't expecting that. I'm respectful. If you tell me to stand in an narthex, I'll stand in an narthex. So I hope that tells you, I mean, it, it, that to me, I mean, I don't know who talked to this monk, Neil, uh, between my meeting with Father, maybe Father Dosatea did, but I, Dosatea, uh, I don't know. 
But he was so friendly when I got there. He knew my name when I got there. Edward, come forward. I just share because it, you bring up a good point. Other questions? Well, I want to thank all of you for coming today. And I pray that all of us on our spiritual journey uh, can immerse ourselves in the prayer, into the tradition, into the Holy Fathers. We are standing on a gold mine in terms of our spirituality. And we shouldn't be ashamed of it. We should draw from it and not worry about what everybody else is doing. But look what's working in Romania, and they're just following our tradition. So I, I wish that for all of you. And, of course, this parish is near and dear to my heart, so I pray for all of you each day. And uh, thank you. Glory to Jesus Christ.